We gotta be. I know. That's why I was honking. Well, I said stop and we could do something, but what? we have point. Get away right then in that Well, cab. he got away because you wouldn't slow down. Not because I wouldn't slow down. I was honking at the cab. You better not Go ahead, okay. please. Yes, it's not hot in here. I'm so happy. It's so hot. I'm, uh... Yeah, that's too sp For sure. Thelma there? Um, may I have to be speaking? This is Dwayne Dog Chapman. Um, she's busy. She's what? She's busy. She's real busy? Mm -hmm. Have you seen Dennis? Um, I think they haven't. They haven't? Yeah. Who are you, the daughter? I'm his son. Oh, you're his son. You're the 12 year old? Yeah. Sorry, what's your first name? Cameron. Cameron, I keep forgetting that. You just is this your dad, right? Yeah. Did you tell your dad I called? Um, my grandma did it. And what did he say? He um said it's gonna call you, but then um he can take them off. He did. No. They beat me out of another one today. Okay, you t you uh, are you okay then, right? Yeah. So is your dad? He didn't get no fight or nothing with the police. No. He went really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you then, son. Okay. Okay. okay bye. Oh, he got they just got him right then. I show oh, man. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. See, that's why it's hard to film in Hawaii. These cops are so good. You got to hurry up and do it. That's the truth, though. I'm not just saying that. Yeah, they just Pahana, and he is. He was allegedly probation violation, and uh, we had him all set up. And Hawaii's finest beat me to the punch. And I'm a little jealous. And there he is. <laughs> this is Chad and Sensia. And then I'm going to look. <clears throat> that we have on him now. So to appear in court. And probably uh, along with his failure to appear in court, probation violation, and now bail bond jumping. Bond jumping. We didn't lose anything. We get we get time to find them before they they take the money. So we were in the timeline, you know. To uh, and and the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled that if the police help us is a good thing because for public safety it's good to take along the cops in Hawaii. So, but I'll get even with them soon. <laughs> I'll catch another one. But that's good. See, I called you, your kid two days ago trying to get you to fix this right. The kid didn't tell you that I called? Oh, all right, so where did you get caught at? Your house, your mama's house? And you didn't give them no problems or nothing? Who caught you? Tommy Caetano and them? Tommy was really nice. It's a good thing he got you, bro. That was, it's a good cop. All right, Dennis, so have him call me. Now be sure you call your mom, tell her you're okay. No, I'll fix it. Just, you know, call your mom. Next call right now to your mom. Okay, so whoever calls for you, tell them to say it's for you. Okay, bye. Like if I'm really mad or I'm really upset, and Tommy will say, now Dwayne, settle down, and you know, listen brother, and he, t you know, I more go to him about stuff, you know what I'm saying? I compete against him, but I go to him for information, even though he's younger than I am, 
he's just a, you know really good and he's like I would and he he is his record for one day him and his squad is like 16 mm. mine's eight mm -hmm. so I mean he's so was he around when you did that Andrew Lester yes. I I called Tommy from Mexico mm -hmm. I called him from the hotel there uh, the papers interviewed Tommy and he sent a message to me kind of coded you know and the Mexicans caught it because they said, oh, this cop is saying, good luck, see you soon. What does that mean? This cop is telling you to escape. And I was like, no, that's not what he's saying. But Tommy said, good luck, so sorry that you're there, see you soon. So, yeah, he's a very good person. So, I guess, first off, what was it like? I mean, I want to... Are we ready? Are we yeah, going? Yeah, okay. yeah, we're ready. Okay. Ready. I mean, I'm going over this, but personally, me, like, as a, like, a Hawaii resident, I want to right. know, like... We hear about you, we read about you, you know, but I mean, take us back to that moment. Like, what was it like when you got the call? I mean, what, what does it take to even build up that case and to go out there? Well, we, we got the call, like we were working the case down in Mexico for over a week. And it was like a roller coaster. It was him, it was not. It was him, it was not. Then we had a film crew with us, so I used the sound guy. We had him on recording, so I told the sound guy, close your eyes and listen. And the sound guy, because the sound guys only hear sound, of course. And so I had like all these professional college grads around me that I was, you know, weighing off, uh, shooting stuff at, saying, what do you think? What do you think? So I had a great team. And I said, uh, I want you to, li I want you, let's wait till the bus goes, yeah. <laughs> Where are you at, Alice? I'm right here. I can't see you making signals at me. <laughs> well, you know, we just don't need to go on the case. We don't. Okay. So I guess, um, what was it that kind of got you up and running to want to get this guy? Well, I, I had uh, talked to some of the victims and, uh, you know, what he did to them. One girl's baby had died and, you know, they were completely asleep. I mean, this is like, he was like a, a living necrophiliac. And uh, crimes against women is, is like one of the worst I think there is. And they, you know, they couldn't... They had called the house and said, we can't go to sleep. Every time we hear the bushes shake or a leaf shake or a dog bark, we think it's Andrew Luster. And we just cannot sleep, dog. And then the girl, you know, got on the phone and said, please, please capture him. And then I met one of the husbands and he said, would you please, when you do capture him, drive him by my house? I said, I don't think I could do that, but I'll try. So I think the victims right at first, I, we were lucky enough to meet them and then meet the husband to one of them and you know it, I just knew that it, that was become my job to get him. And then like if you could sum up the chase, I mean what did it take? Well it took a lot, I mean it, 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 uh, it took a lot of faith and positive thinking you know because like I say we were on a roller coaster, it wasn't him, it was him, it wasn't him, it was him, it was up and down, up and down and uh, finally of course it was but it, it took a lot to to you know, stay there and keep persistent on it because he's a very intelligent guy. He had a lot of money, and he was a you know. I said at first he wasn't a seasoned criminal, wasn't a professional criminal, so he didn't know about running. But the, the more and more I got into it, he must have read a lot of books about running because he knew what to do. And you know, luck was on our side also. It wasn't all just skill. We we uh, we had a lot of luck with us too. So. And of course, though, it takes a lot of what, like investigative work too. It's not easy, right? No, it's not easy. We we uh, we were hungry. We were cold. We were hot. We were we almost died once in a. Uh, we had a canoe paddle that had. We after we got four miles down in this terrible little canal, it had holes in it. We had to row back, and the water was up to our thighs. And I told my son, "This is the story your dad doesn't want to tell you, son. But when you see that bank, if you don't jump, you're going to see Jesus in a minute. So." You better follow your dad to that shore. So we had, it was hard. We got bit by scorpions. I mean, it was, you know, we had to hang in there. We had to keep calling Beth and, you know, she reminded me of the bills and all that do. So, I mean, it wasn't easy. It was a hard bust. So it's We're in uh, Thailand. We had leads in Brazil, France, and Mexico, Colorado, Nevada. Uh, that's about it. That's the places he had been and all of his friends were saying these are the places he could be. Now I knew in the very beginning that he spoke Spanish fluently. So any lead that said Mexico, there was a little something back in my mind. When he left, I asked the police what was in the house. And they said, well, he took his clothing, his dog, and his surfboard. 
And I thought, hmm. And I said, well, did he write down anything? Because one of the victims had told me, he writes on everything. He's an, he just writes on, like when he would send a fax on the other side of the fax would be scribble notes on the bottom. So I knew, uh-oh, because I've ch you know chased guys that did that before. So I knew that looked for some kind of note or scratch. The police officer said, oh, we do have a note that says Brazil, a couple other countries, and Mexico that was all tore up. And I said, oh, that's it. And they said, oh, no, we give no credence to that at all. And I said, well, can you tape it together? Let me look at it so I can touch it, feel it, close my eyes and think about it. No, he said, that's you know, insignificant. We, we're not going to go with that at all. He's not stupid enough to do that. That was like a trap left there. And I thought, no, that's not, you know, you're thinking too much like a cop. You know, and they come to find out that I was right, that that's where he was in Mexico. So he'd written all that stuff down. And like when they captured him, he had pickups lined to Mexican girls. He had written, you know, you have a, a nice shirt, you, know, you have a nice part of your body in Spanish. And I thought, well now, if he speaks fluent Spanish, why would he be writing that down? And come to find out he had four bodyguards and another American young white kid with him. So he was training this other kid on what to do. So not only was he doing stuff again himself in another country, he was training other people to do the exact same thing. So it sounds like you're almost in his head. I mean, it, you really have to know him and who he is, his yes. habits, everything. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, you have to uh, see on a lot of guys you can get inside. You can guess which way they're going to turn or where they're going to go see their mother and all that. Where. A rapist is hard to get inside because you can, you know, how does he do it? Why does he do it? Especially when they're asleep. I mean, what kind of, you know, every man or woman wants their mate awake. I mean, you know, that's half of it is see the face or hear the sounds. But to be completely asleep like that, I mean, what kind of person would do that kind of stuff? So it was hard to get into Andrew Luster's mind. So I had to just not use any other things that I had learned before. I had to just concentrate on Andrew Stewart Luster and it, it was hard you couldn't get you know I couldn't guess when he'd be calling every time I guessed it was wrong I mean I just had to put everything I had learned out and act like I was a brand new bounty hunter just looking for my first catch once I did that then things started coming together I couldn't use any of my you know previous experience because none of it worked I had never chased a necrophiliac before and I mean that to me, when, when you chase a robber, the first time he robs a 7-Eleven, he puts his hand in his shirt and uses his finger. Second time, he might use a BB gun. The third time, he uses a real gun. And usually by the fourth or fifth time, he shoots the clerk. So with Andrew Luster, if he was graduating into something, I knew it was going to be, you know, graduating into someone who was dead. Because what's the difference between a girl that's completely dead and someone who's, except for the snoring, who's absolutely completely gone you know asleep and he would pick up their limbs like their arms and stuff on the show and move them over when he taped everything and he'd move their legs and then set them in just right areas and I thought you know you scum and then uh, when I saw the show by one of the shows Lifetime Entertainment the one of the victims said dog and she's kind of a you know a hard girl she's not she's not easy to make cry right and she was crying on the phone and she said there's someone watching that thanks us more than uh, that will thank you more than us and until I saw the show I didn't ever know what she meant that didn't enter my mind just as I was going to get him I was an hour and a half away that voice of her saying that there's someone who's watching that's gonna appreciate you catching him more than any of us I remembered that and I thought what could she be talking about her mother something like that when I sh saw the show on Lifetime she had lost the twin and the twin had died and I thought, oh, and when I called her, she said, I didn't want to tell you that. And I said, why didn't you want to tell me? She goes, well, I know you're a father of so many kids. I wanted him to come back alive. I said, well, I wouldn't have hurt him that bad. But so, you know, there it was uh, it was heart wrenching to. And then she said, I, my little baby who died is happy now. You know, tell he us, can live. Tell us about the moments leading up to this capture. Well, we were. Uh, excited you know like I say one minute then the next minute we weren't and the one minute we were the next minute we weren't Can you tell us where you were? we were in a in Puerto Vallarta Mexico and I had gotten calls that my team my son and my brother had found him and then uh, my brother the informants were there and then the informants were like saying oh I wonder yes I wonder how much 
Okay. The informants were like, I wonder how much Andrew Luster would pay if he knew you were here. So I was battling everything. You know, I was battling the informants, Luster, his people, all that. So uh, right when they first seen him, when they first seen him, I was excited. And then they said, oh, it's not him. And then, okay, we found him. Now he whipped a U-turn in the middle of the street. He lost us. And then uh, when I saw him, it was over. We had, we had picked a song. Boxers, when they box, let me take a drink of this. <clears throat> what is the name of that song, Alice? When boxers box a lot of times, and I was a professional boxer till 1990, you pick a song and you work on the bag with this one particular song, and then when you're ready to fight in the ring, they play that song for you, so it gets you excited, your adrenaline's going, ding, the bell rings, and it's on, right? So we put, picked uh, Lose Yourself by Eminem you know, capture the moment, to do do. And one time we was walking down the street with the actor Boris Krudenog. I was walking down the street and he goes, dog, come listen. And I went into this little Mexican place and a little 17 year old boy had a bandana and he was jamming out to Eminem. And so I asked the little boy, I said, do you know who that is? Do you speak English? And he said, no. I said, but you like the music? He said, oh, we all like the music. And then the next couple days in a, in a cab, the guy was playing the same Eminem song. And I was like, oh, this is the song I picked it was great. So, just as, and I, I don't want to give the whole thing away because we taped it, so, but just as I seen him, that song came on the radio. And I was like, oh, that's a sign from God, right? What was the feeling inside Oh, it was, it was like... Was like there anger or just, I mean, what was that feeling like? Knowing that he's right there or something? The feeling is like the feeling of when they come out and they say, it's a healthy boy or girl. Or... If you scratch a lottery ticket and you look down and it says you are a winner of fifty thousand dollars, you just take a deep breath of clean, fresh air, and every problem that you have just goes away. And I was concentrated on Zoom. Oh my God! It's Andrew Stewart Luster. And just as I said that in my spirit, in my to myself, the song came on the radio, and I knew this is it. This is the song. You don't get a little nervous about how you're going to apprehend him or approach him or scare him away? Or? No. That fear, I don't allow that to come around. Then what's the next step after you feel that sudden burst of energy? You attack. No. <laughs> no. Uh, well, you, you attack. I mean, you, you look at what's around. You know, I've got a team that takes care. I am focused on the fugitive. My team takes care of everything else. Did he uh, see you? No. He saw me when I was from here to you. When I got I got down on the ground, like spun around like Spider-Man and stuff, where he could have looked, if he would have looked, he'd have seen me right in the street. But to, to the music, I heard boom, boom, and I made steps like the music, and I was like almost dancing, right? And I was like, oh God, oh my God. And then I spun around, and as I stood up, I told him, freeze, Andrew Stewart Luster. And his eyes got real big, and he screamed like a girl, ah, like that. And just then, I'll stop right there, because with the rest, you should see on tape. But he, uh, he was very, very surprised very very surprised because he had been watching the shows where I was you know fee fi full foam look out luster here I come and he was he knew what I looked like uh, we had information we're not sure that he had my picture he had told his bodyguards if you see this kind of guy tell me he's here so you know he thought he was set up so when and he was all happy and he was all loaded you know he uh, like that and once he saw my face he completely freaked out I'm sure his life went you know went just like that in front of him and that so it was kind of like a game between the both of you guys it is a game and it, it gets like that it is a good guy versus bad guy it's absolutely a game except i also heard that he even had your name on a hit list I well mean, that's yes a different game yeah he's a, yeah that's a different game he uh but he had the district attorney he had the judge he had a couple other people and us so he i think even though we were on the top of the list he's you know he can't uh, hopefully he can't do anything about it because he's got to do 124 years first then he can come out and do revenge when you captured him did you say anything to him a few words maybe yes something some kind of lesson, something, whatever yes came out I, of your mouth. well I you know again I don't want to say exactly everything but I had him for five minutes and I told him and I said some things to him that he'll never forget and he said some things to me that I'll never forget but one thing I could say when I all of his friends say said that he is a very a boastful person that he is so arrogant that you'll never believe how arrogant he is 
from his mother to his enemy, all in between, said those words. He is so arrogant, you won't believe it. Well, after we captured him, the cop said, what is your name? And he said, my name is David Carrera. And I looked him right in the eyes and I said, you tell the truth right now. And he put his hands back and his chest out and he said, my name is Andrew Stewart Luster. And when he said that, I got chicken skin all over my body and I know tears swelled up my eyes and I looked him right in the face and he looked me right in my face and he was proud to be who he was. I was a lot prouder to be who I was at that second, but he was very proud of who he was. So he went down in a blaze of glory and he was, you know, boastful and this arrogant guy all the way through it. Did and he get any feeling that he had any kind of resentment for what he did or any sorrow? None at all. He told me he was set up. Some of the things he told me, I didn't do nothing. I was set up. Sure you were, I said. Okay, whatever. Tell that to the victims. I mean, he, you know, his lawyer said in the one of the last things the lawyer said to the jury is these women don't deserve you listening about this. You know, they tried to make it sound like the women were hookers. They were, like they bought them in brothels. So these are married women. These are decent girls. One was 16 years old. And I heard our president say just before that, these American people, you will not come hurt our children. You will not come hurt Americans. No matter where you go, we will hunt you down and find you. We included me. Now you went out with a job to do and you did it. Is, your, is another part of your job also making an impression on the people that you capture, such as Andrew Luster? I mean, do you want him to learn a lesson? I, you didn't tell us what you told him, but I mean, well, you know, there's an age, there's an, a time and a place and an age. I, th I mean, I don't want to say some people at 40, past 40, you can never deal with. Some people past 21. I mean, you know, there's an age group that you just, they're too far gone. Andrew Luster's too far gone. There was no remorse. There was no nothing. The girls are lying. You know what? I mean, when you get someone like that, there's nothing. You're just, uh, you're like, throwing your pearls before the swine, as the New Testament says, why even do it? Because you're just wasting your breath. I mean, he was still says he's innocent yesterday. You know, he has no remorse for none of that stuff. He was a rich boy, Andrew Luster, who could do anything he wants to do. And that's how his whole life went, right to the exact second as of, like I say, yesterday. He has no remorse at all. Those kind of guys you can never change a bit. Those are the guys who deserve to be put in a cell, caged up, and fed until they get too old to hurt anybody else because they're not going to change at all. I don't believe they deserve to be killed, but they deserve to be housed in a cell and fed and, you know, until they get too old to do their crimes. And he's one of those kind of guys. And is that the reason why you do this job, to get them off? Yes. Well, it's, I, you know, this is a calling I have. I mean, you know, I was a little boy and I watched, uh, oh, I watched Sky King and I watched Wanted Dead or Alive and uh, since my whole life is always, you know, I always liked the, who was that mass stranger, the long ranger and, you know, I always wished I was that way. I wanted to be the guy that rescued the girl from the fire and, you know, I just wanted to be like that. But how did, how did you even get involved from the start? Get from, with Andrew Luster? Like, oh no, like a bounty hunter in general. Well, you know, I was a bad guy in the 70s and I, I developed a conscience and I had none at 20 and at 23 all of a sudden this thing called a conscience entered my body and I thought, did I, I hurt that person's feelings? You know, I stole their watch, they liked, they got it from their mother and all of a sudden this conscience started eating a hole in my heart and I said, you know, this stuff that I'm doing now is not worth it. I'd rather do good things and have people say, oh, what a great guy he is, than have fear and, oh, watch out who he is, you know. And that, thank God, took over. Did anybody help you see that light? Oh, all, every single person. Uh, every judge, every cop, my, my parents, my girlfriends. I mean, I had, the, of course, this other side of the coin, you know, my friends, my street friends, my biker friends, but the love that they gave me and the support that the good people gave me outweighed the bad. And, I, and you need that. I mean, if you want to become a good person and stay a good person, you need that family and preacher and cops. I mean, I was pulled over by cops that said, Dwayne, there's something else for your life. I'll never forget that. He said, 
I'm gonna let you go this time because I know someday there's something in your future and I'll never forget that. And he was right. But was there a particular person that told you to go ahead and bounty hunt? Was there someone that introduced you to that? Because I read that there was a Well, judge yeah, there. there was, yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's what I'm getting. Yeah. I had a Judge Levi in Adams County, uh, in uh, Brighton, Colorado, and he saw a quality in me that I didn't see, and he said, how would you like to go catch this guy right here to pay one month of my child support? And I said, absolutely. And he said, you catch him, and I'll pay a month. And I caught him, then he gave me another one. He gave me three or four, and then he said, now, I want you to go see the FBI, and I want you to go see bail bondsmen. And he said, because, have you ever heard of a bounty hunter? And I was like, oh, yeah. You know, I watched Josh Randall on Wanted, Dead or Alive when I was 13, 12 years old. And he said, well, you'd make a good bounty hunter. I want you to go contact these people. So I made phone calls to the FBI and bail bondsmen. And I started getting all these mug shots and pictures. And I started calling people's mothers. And that's how I started. The leather couch with the television, you see. So I feel comfortable. You see how my office is set up just like the house. My office is Denver and Denver set up just like the house. So I feel comfortable seeing what's going on, having two, three phones. You know, that's just it's a comfortable surrounding and things in this in this job like yesterday I got out of the car and found a penny and I'm like oh a lucky penny so right now during this hunt any good thing or lucky thing or you know like some uh, NFL players for the Super Bowl they never wash their jersey and I'm like oh I get it I understand so what's comfortable what's lucky what worked before you want to keep that going you think sometimes though that it interferes with your you know, personal life, your your family, your kids. Well, but it's better that it's against a lot of star babies, so they got to get you know they got to get over that. It does it, it it interferes a lot, but we have to take out time. We must take out time with the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much accept it. I mean, yes. like you were ready to tell them on that dinner, um, you know, a little talk. Right, and they're like, yes, every time when I go, I tell them, you know, uh, we quit, we quit, uh, I take a cab from the house now, because the worst thing of all is leaving when they all go to the airport, so I take a cab from the house when they're by dad, and, you know, we don't make it such a big thing, because it's sad when they, all the kids are there, they drop me off the airport, and everybody's crying, and this way you could say, okay, aloha, we're gone, we, we go. Mm -hmm. So they know that you're working on this case. Yes. And they know that you're getting close to being home. Yes. And well, I start preparing them two or three days ahead of time. So what do you, what, what is an example of what you tell them? Uh, Daddy's going to go catch a bad guy. What do you guys want? I'm going to Oregon. I'll show them pictures, Beth will, of what's in Oregon, like walruses. So you see how many stuffed animals I've got from all over the world for Bonnie. Local boy don't care. He just wants a Batman t-shirt from Oregon. So Beth will get on the internet, print out what it looks like, and then tell Bonnie, you know, what do you want? There's walruses there. We'll buy a stuffed walrus or, I mean, from all over the, you see her stuffed animals from all over the world. And Beth picks out the stuff to, you know, that I bring home. you're actually home. out there doing your job. Let's say, for example, you go to work and you're doing your job. This is your job and you're, you know, you're focused. But at the same time, in the back of your mind, is your family there. Right, absolutely. Well, what listen. your mind? Well, you know, people, let me ask, let me answer your question with the question. People have asked me, dog, what gives you the what gives you the bravery or the what's another word for that? Intest uh, internal and in, no uh Cajones. Yeah, what gives you the courage, what gives you the bravery, what gives you the fortitude to do that? It's not that. It's that I'll be I'll, I'll know the guy that the fugitives in the house and I look around there's a pit bull on the side all the windows are drawn your mind thinks oh he's got a shotgun he could see me and all of a sudden the phone rings and it's Bonnie or it's Beth or it's Cecily and you know dad I've got this tonight or you know dad can you bring some money and you're like you know you do it. and it's not bravery it's necessity I mean it's like I say it's against a lot of star babies they gotta eat so a lot of it, you're, you do it out of necessity. You must do it. You must capture the guy. The kids are home. They, you know, you've got to do that. And and when you come home with the capture, I don't think I've done it maybe one time. I'll say that not to be a braggart, but I think there's never been one time that I didn't come home without of capturing the guy. So right away, Beth lets him loose, and they come running to me, and Daddy, Daddy, you know that's. What's that feel like? That's the greatest feeling in the whole world. 
That's like winning a Super Bowl or winning a 10 round super weight heavyweight title of the world. It's like this great thing that you've done because you think about those things when the mosquitoes are biting you or when your car runs, it runs out of gas out of town, you don't know where you're at. You just keep thinking the kids are at home. Though. Beth is there, though, you know, everybody's there, you must catch the guy. So like a successful mission is important to you, but what's more important is seeing the family at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, not maybe not at the end of the day, but necessarily at the end of the investigation. Because every single time I catch the guy, within seconds after he's cuffed, as I'm searching him, I hit Beth on the phone and I tell her, who's the greatest bounty hunter in the world? And she says, oh my God, honey, you got him. I heard you um, asking Gary if you want to be a bounty hunter when you grow up, are you yes. serious in asking him that? Do you want him to be that? Yes, or? yes. Well, I would like, because they would, we're, I would like them to all be in law enforcement. You know, my son Lena and I used to tell him, are you going to be a bounty hunter? Now he is one, a bondsman bounty hunter in Big Island. But I would like him to be in some, a police officer, a lawyer, a judge, some kind of law enforcement that's in their blood. And he wants to be Batman, so he's close. Yeah, he's close, Batman. He lets me be Robin once in a while, as you see. Right? Hey, no, I'm Batman. Okay, you're Batman, son. But that's kind of how you train, you know, you train your kids. Would you like to play the piano when they're two and three? And then when they're six, they're like, I want piano lessons, Dad. Oh, really? Why? So that's just training them to be like that. And I've had enough kids to learn by mistakes. You know, I've had a, I've had babies since I was 15, so each baby you learn what you should do better in that. It, it's hard to say that you make a mistake as a parent, but you better realize, the parents better realize they do. But each child that you have, thank God, you can fix that mistake you made with the first one. So these last ones, hopefully they'll be perfect, right? And then now switching gears, and you don't have to answer this technically, you can just tell us what you want to tell us. But this organ case now, it's moving forward. I mean, you're getting yes. leads every day, it seems, or I don't know how, you're not on the watch, like every moment or minute, hour, I'm not sure. But you're getting close. How are you feeling about it now, generally? Well, I'm, it's developing very good. I feel very good. We're, you know, it's, it's frustrating because like you look in, every, you know, Canada, Mexico, and every 50 states, and you start thinking, oh my God, how in the world am I ever going to find this guy? Then you go on faith, which faith is what have you done before that you can prepare success to. So I would always now, of course the last capture was Andrew Luster, so you prepare, could you, what about the day when you never had no idea where Andrew Luster was? As long as you stay on it, then it's the, the leads will develop. You feel like you're getting close? Yes, I feel closer, not close. Well, you'll all be gone when I'm close, but I'm getting closer. You just can't go and show up as, you know, dog is here, you better have a good reason to show up. So now we've developed, the father is now mad at me, so he needs to meet me in person. The guy does have a mentor, which nobody knew about till tonight. So he may have said a couple words. I wonder if it's snowing in Switzerland right now or something like that. So now's the time to at least go interview the father. I know this guy's going to call his mom or dad. I know it. He's done it for almost 40 years. He's going to call her. Once you you in this job, you've got to be able to talk a mother out of her child. And you've got to be able to convince that mother that what you're doing is right and what she will do is right. So I need to show up in person, sit the mom and dad down, explain the ins and outs. I've been there, I know, not for this charge, but I know what it's gonna be like, you must help me. And then see his mentor, his sensei, whatever, and let him meet me to see that, you know, that the, uh, I'm not motivated by the money or I'm, I'm actually motivated by the capture. And well, I'll been be gone for maybe about like what three weeks now. He's been gone. Uh, say it louder. Three weeks tomorrow. So, so what, what feeling right now? I mean, you feel like you're gonna catch him? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now listen, let me ask you. You you understand where when you know that you've done it before, you can do it again, right? So you compare Andrew Luster to Andrew Garber. There's no comparison. Andrew Luster had $30 million at his disposal. $30 million. Andrew Luster picked up the phone and got money wired to him anywhere in America. Can Garber do that? Andrew Luster was raised a rich boy and was felt like her still when I arrested Andrew Luster. He still had his chest out and his back up. And he said, my name is Andrew Stewart Luster. See, that was a hard capture. This guy is nothing. And as long as you keep saying that and you 
you know, if you say it many times, you yourself will finally believe it. So it's as long as... Ready to leave, like, go to order. Well, yes, I would if it wasn't for the weekend, because everything, of course, like any other state, from 8 to 5 on the weekends is closed. So once Monday comes where I could go to social services and, you know, the courthouse and stuff like that, I'm ready to go. Because now I've got, I've got to meet the father and I've got to meet the mentor. Um, in closing, is there anything you want to say? We're, we're trying to hopefully paint a picture of you as a bounty hunter, as being a father. Is there anything that you want, would like Hawaii to know you as? Or if there's any like misconception out there that you want to know? Is there anything that you want to say about yourself or share with us? Just in closing, and if there's anything. Uh. Say that again, because I'm yeah. lost. Well, it's like we're just trying to capture our, right. the all sides of you, if we can. Yeah, you got a suggestion for that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're the father, you're, you're a bounty hunter. Your mother's I mean, very here. You're a warrior from Hawaii. You're. Well, yeah. so who you're are you, home. basically? Who are you? This somebody is my home. To, like, this is I see I you in the pictures. Like, is that what? Is that the only thing that you're all about? You know, is that all you're all, all about? I mean, who are you? No, I. Who's who is doing that? Yeah. Oh, that's so hard for me yeah, and myself to answer. That's, but let me tell you this, okay? Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins years ago asked me, what would you want on your gravesite? Would you want the world's greatest dad? Would you want the world's greatest bounty hunter? Would you want, you know, no one ever escaped your capture? When I was in Mexico, the little children came up to me with their mothers, and they were calling me El Perro, which is the dog. And they were touching on my arms and touching on my hair and reaching through the bars and saying, El Pedro, El Pedro. And they were touching me and I was smiling with them. And their mothers would let them touch my face. And I said, you know what? I realized what I'd like on my tombstone now is here lies El Pedro. Because that about covered all of them. You know, he's, he's uh, tries to be a tough guy, but it doesn't always work out that way. And tough guys may not finish first. So I mean, you know, it's just I'm all I'm all those things. I'm lost, so I can't talk about myself. I don't know what to say. <laughs> all right. Hey, Duncan, you have any other lessons that you wanted to offer? Yeah. No, because the baby will uh, like disturb the mic. The culture, the style. Okay. I love it's it. It's rolling you know stuff. I mean? Did you? It, you know what? It was oh, fine. Yeah, but it was showing right here. You're not gonna see it. Oh, no, that means you got some tiny-ass shit right here. No, I, I got it here. And you can see every single thing on my face. No. I'll make sure I do shoot yeah. it that way. Oh. It will not happen. You won't see it. It, it looks sure. good. It looks very nice. Very soft lighting. I'd have it. Here. Very so. Marilyn Monroe-ish. Oh, would you? Yes, I would. It's rolling, Steph. It's yours. I guess, so what is the day to life for Beth? I mean, talk about everything. I mean, you you seem like you do it all, too. <laughs> Um, you guys have been busy. Yeah. What is it like? You have family as well? You're helping the game? Yeah, it's uh, challenging. It's a lot of work. I mean, what did we just see here tonight? Was that even, <laughs> was that even like, is that just no, like I just like to the see pie or oh, is there like a right? Oh no, there's so much. The lights will um, stop. Oh, she looks good. The average day starts here at about 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Because we also have business to set up the first one starting and so I'm usually updating the school and then breakfast and then the kids up to school and give me two acceptance. Oh, only two a day. It's terrible. All the wild things are going on. We can call it a little. All the connections are all flooding in. Leads yeah. from the mainland on these oh, like that that so real. far behind <laughs> in the time that you know people are like waiting, sort of chomping at the bit, waiting for eight o'clock here, you know, so that they can start having calls. Yeah. 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 This is a, it was a very yeah. mild, yeah. very mild <laughs> day. Um, <laughs> we generally have a lot of staff. I'm sorry. That come out here and help. We've got a yeah, person really. that's here all the time helping out, lending you know assistance to whatever. We have a really great great assistant at our office. He's a liaison between me and the courts and because they know that I'm so, so slammed that they direct a lot of the clerical questions to him and, you know, we, we just muddle along and we just 
uh, take our computer in the car and we hunt and we chase and then the bundle calls from the kids and we just make it work. So and how, how do the kids react to the TV being lost? I'm not on my TV. Yeah. 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 Now you're also being in a lot of game or the news videos. How do you, um, you know, how, how do you make it so that they don't look at things different? You know, I think that it's been so much more to their everyday life that they don't. It's not, it's not strange for them. They've had cameras in their homes and cameras in the office and cameras installed in our Car, you know, that we've just been in the line for so long that the smaller kids, uh, Cecily's age on down, are really used to it. The older kids have a harder time with it, in my opinion. The smaller kids, because they're just like, hello, you want to give me some time? Do you want to let me, you know, dad? You know, you've been at work all day, you've been on the phone all day, I need to have more time. So the older kids who, um, you know, the 18-year-old, 20-year-old just had a baby, you know, Leland on the other hand, and they're all like, Dad, you know, they, they need their attention, and sometimes he has to just go, okay, wait, you know, and he takes the time out, and he goes, and he calls, and he spends the time that they need. Well, you that's how you that's the most that was, thing. I, I mean, like, managing that was like the hardest thing for you guys. Yeah, when he was uh, in, in jail in Mexico, was the most worried I've seen the kids in quite some time. And they all, from all of the states where they were, were constantly on the phones. The rest of the family flew in. So here, we had a command post going from here. We had a command post in LA. And we had a command post in Colorado. And every single office had their own job. Like Colorado's job was they were a Spanish, oh, yeah. very, very, very yeah. dear friend who's been bonds with for a very long time. She speaks fluent Spanish. She has a lot of connections in Mexico that have been uniform. So they were working the political end down there. Who do you know? Who do we need to get to? Yeah. See, I want to send our letters. So they had everybody going in the last section. The people in LA were working as attorneys. And she told us the story. And she was in the trees and all of those things. And then here, you know, I go, I'm a bond. You know, that's what I do is keep people out of jail. So I was working immigration for New Jersey and, you know, where every, every state you know, that I right. know does immigration and can pull them out of there. I really was hoping for deportation. I was hoping that they'd throw them in immigration and they'd just deport them. Because that would have been the fastest route out. How did you feel when you came home? I was just frightened. I didn't want to let him get out of sight for you know, quite some time. And, you know, it was, it was a really good thing. Because clearly they did a good job. But he, you know, it was, touch a ball for quite some time. We really didn't know what to think. The kids were very frightened and they were very scared because they had never encountered that. And, you know, of course, the only glimpses of the one I was getting is what I would see on the television. So the TVs all around the house is what I would see on MSNBC and Fox, ABC, you know, a, a TV for every, for every network because I didn't want to miss one glimpse of that television. And it's fine. And I literally was at cell phone numbers to all of the correspondents who were down on the streets. So if, if I would get news that they were going to court, I would give that news to the correspondents so that the correspondent could get a camera over there so I should catch a glimpse of it, you know, just to make sure that they were alive. And he looked so bad that I knew things were going wrong and things were not right because the way he looked as he made the capture and as the days progressed in the jail, he started wearing and looking worse and 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 I could see it in their faces and I knew that things were you know, getting very serious. So, you know, it's good. Mm -hmm. She was very sad. Now, who watched you? It seems that folks are tearing me. Would you say that you're a bounty hunter? Yes, the hunters. <laughs> it's uh, bounty hunting with uh, the hunters, you know? We argue with five, you know, shove each other a little bit, you know, playful shoving, you know, with them. But it's, a, you know, I'm a woman, and I think of other things, you know, than I guess I think of, you know, and then sort of think you can buy makeup in a seven. So, you know, of course, that's where I try to go, you know, you cannot, you know. 
You don't buy nylons there either. You know, you just, there's things that a woman will contribute to a chase that a man will not think of. You know, especially when, um, you know, there's women that you chase me, there's men that have, that are sexual characters, you know, and the bait sometimes. You know, so I mean, my goal has always been more. Um, I'm so protective of the family and of the way his reputation that I have to make sure that every single thing is absolutely correct before he makes it because our family doesn't want to be So I have to make sure as you know, the mother of the family that we be sure that we do the right thing, keep the right door, the rest the right way. You know, all of those things have to be corrected. And on that note, I asked the ladies, but why do you, what drives you in what she do? Why, why do you do this? Like, I know that when, when it comes down to like the end of the guy, you get a second and you can feel that, you know, driving force. Yeah. 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 Well, it started out because we were both in bail. When we started out, it was like, if you write a bad bomb, it could put you out of business. You could lose your home, you could lose your car, you could lose, you know, so, okay, so, I'm gonna, so quickly. Mm -hmm. One bad bond, you're out, you know, you've lost everything. So, okay. Oh, okay. in the beginning, it started out as a first survival. Okay. And then it progressed into the use of two leaders. Oh, and the, and the race, the good guy versus bad guy. And the police are on border these days with terrorists and protecting our borders and all of these things. So it's really, we feel that it's our duty to help out. And this is our community. We live here. This is our country. America is beautiful. And, you know, you have to help. Because if you don't help, then you don't get all the freedoms that you've been awarded, and you take those freedoms for granted. And it's amazing that people that are involved in the criminal justice system don't really realize you're a walking victim waiting to happen. You know, especially in this age, day and age of ICE, where you know, you've got so much property crime, you have so many people that have just fallen prey to this horrible, horrible drug, that unless you have the knowledge to know how to not be the victim, you're going to be there. So, our knowledge of the criminal justice system and how it works is invaluable. We've been doing it for so long, and I was a lobbyist, and I changed laws, and I actually rewrote the bail code so that the accused still actually was presumed innocent, you know, which is sort of a far fetch today. In today's day and age, you're basically guilty until you prove yourself innocent, and that's not how it's supposed to be. So, we try to restore a little bit of the balance, you know, back with the skills of justice you might be blind but not stupid you know so we just try to be the best consultants that we can be to our clients without you know appearing you know we're not a judgment jury so it's easier for them to bounce things off of us than it is you know if they're like ah oh, what'd you say oh my god you know but they can say it to us and we'll go oh my god don't say that again you know what i mean that is not going to help you but, you know, we just try to show them the path and try to lead them out. And a lot of these people that can on their strokes just don't have a reason to get them, you know? So you've got to give them a reason. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like touchy? You guys do a lot of harsh subjects. I mean, is there anything touchy that sometimes you don't want to tell them or you don't share with them? Or are you folks totally open? For the most part, we're totally open. But when it comes to crimes against children, um, yeah, you know, it, it's difficult. But, you know, what, what gives us great, a better, it's a, what gives us a better advantage over some of these people is that we have so many kids. And we've been through 12 children, and we've been through 12, or let's see, nine of them have made it through their teenage years. So we know at what age sparks what behavior, because we've seen it so many times already. So we know what that 15-year-old's feeling and thinking and going through, because our 16-year-old daughter just went through these whole same things. So we know about all the little games that they play, and you know, when they're in high school, they're sneaking out to parties. Well, mom and dad, the are hiding outside the bush, you know what I mean? Wait for the barbecue, you go, you know what I mean? We know what to do because we've had all these kids, and we know what 
ages sparked the war from 17 to 21. Um, they argue about everything. Yeah, they you know, been there, done it, know everything. Always so quick move out while you still want to get support. You know what I mean? But I think between the ages of about you know 13 to 15, you know, they're going through these hormonal changes as the girls are, and you know they've got you know the hormones are shooting, and they're just you know they're lusting with their eyes, and they're not really you know they're just coming into being a girl. What do you see in the future for the consumer family? Uh, you know, I just see, I see happiness and a little bit more calm, peaceable, you know. I know it's going to be, this is the calm before the storm right now, but I think in the long run, you know, the stress and the, the absolute anguish that we, every single month, if the bills are $5,000, we make $4,900. Eighty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. We can always fall just a little bit short, and I think through this, we know we're making a little bit of financial stability. Where, you know, I won't have to be, you know, counting the pennies at the end of the month to make sure that we make it. You know, bail is not very good, and you know, uh, states are. You know, more and more going personal yeah, it's working, it's working which are released, which is terrible for the community, yeah. terrible for the court. I don't know why they do those things, but they do. But, you know, I think that, you know, I think that what Dwayne does, the Lord of Blessings, with what Dwayne does, he gives the Lord of Blessings. And I think that somewhere in the Bible it says there shall be more than enough. And I just believe that. Anything else that you want to ask, Duncan? Or? Nope. Sit. And I'll set up for. Hey, mommy. Local boy has school tomorrow. Are you going to watch your show, Batman? I wish huh? your Baba. I know your Baba's right there. Okay, love you. Kiss. Kiss first. Mm -hmm. Love you. Now listen, when people say love you, say love you too, Dad. Okay, love you too. Okay, see you tomorrow. Are you going to stay in bed now? You promise? You got your favorite pillow? And your favorite movie on? Okay, you're fine, right? Okay, love you. Love you. Love night night. Bye. Night night, son. Okay. So, please, please. Please, please. C-E-C-I-L-Y. So tell us about, um, tell us about your family. Um, I have 12 brothers and sisters. I have eight brothers. I have three, three sisters. Living here would be Dog. all 12. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh Dog. Uh-oh, Bonnie. Uh-oh, Bonnie. 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 What are you doing, Bonnie Chapman? Bonnie Joe. Here you go. You in the room. Dad, I need to go you go in that room with come your here, mom. You're going to come with me right now because you cannot be trusted. Yeah. Come right now because you cannot be trusted. Thanks. Start over. Start over. Yeah. Yeah, it's wrong. It's still wrong. What do you think about what your mom and dad does? Um, it's pretty cool because I go to school and like right when dad got back, it was like people were saying like, um, hey, you're your dad's dog the bounty hunter, right? Tell him he did a good job. Or like at the office, they'd be like, oh, Cecily, how's your, do how's your dad doing? I'm like, oh, he's doing great. And then he's like, okay, then, bye. Mm -hmm. so you think, so is that what you want to be when you grow up? Mm, no, I want to be a secretary. Huh? His secretary. Your dad's secretary? Yeah. Mm. Or like, if like, you know, if he, um, graduates kind of mm -hmm. um then i'll probably do leland or something my older brother's secretary or whatever yeah. but um it would be cool if i did the secretary any of any of them what do you think so cool about it um that uh you make more money than a cop sometimes <laughs> anything how about catching the bad guy or anything like that? um he's actually more better yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's more better. Well, I guess just recently he was telling me that he's going to grow and stuff. But what, what do you tell you? 
Um, he said, I'll miss you. If I don't come back, because he, he got Andrew Luster on my birthday, so that was kind of scary, but yeah. He said, if I don't make it for your birthday, I promise next birthday you'll have double. And uh, he's a pretty good birthday, but it was crazy. It was crazy. Is it hard, um, you know, being here and sometimes your parents are so busy doing their work? Or? Um, no, not really. Sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, we're really busy, um, so, but I, I, take, I help take care of the kids, so it gets some of that off their back, so they don't have to stress about that. So, yeah. And when you're working, do you, like, try to, what are you guys doing, or watch, or? You know? Or I try to watch, but they tell me to go watch the kids. <laughs> so you kind of sometimes, do, do you tell dad, you know, what, what do you tell dad when he's like, born, and, or your mom? I tell him that, um, be careful, and I'll miss you, and I love you, and uh, come home. <laughs>